Thank you, Bella. It's really kind of you. I know it's uh, um, my topic seems to be a bit uh, perhaps uh, romantic or too emotional or even too naive to talk about children in the context of security and conflicts. But I guess based on what we've heard in the morning, it is quite obvious that um, when it comes to the crisis and, uh, and conflict situations, uh, still, although the robots are coming soon, as we have learned, uh, it's human beings who are making all this good or bad, causing good or harm. And um, obviously my primary intention has always been to work with uh, issues concerning children that the quality of our capacities and uh, life in adult life is based on our childhood and based on our upbringing. So the question is, how are we ensuring that the developmental needs of children their need for nurturing, emotional well-being is served properly. Otherwise, as we all know, and we can see throughout the history and even today, many, or if not all of the conflicts and uh, uncertainties caused are actually created by those persons whose character, motivation, attitude is not exactly what we would find appropriate from the future of the mankind. And perhaps it sounds uh, a little bit far from the original topics, but I hope that I can just demonstrate by a number of uh, numbers, data, uh, that we are in a crisis when it comes to the well-being of children all over the world. And I'm just talking today uh, in a very narrow way about the children in situations of migrations and not talking globally about um, child poverty the exploitation, exclusion of children um, and the social deprivation that has got a, a huge impact, obviously. But because of the topic of the conference, I was uh, asked to talk about migration. So when we want to define what we are talking about, obviously we have to go to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and be clear that we define children as human beings below the age of 18, meaning that everybody under the age of 18 should be considered as a child in whatever situation they are at. And obviously migration is one of those situations when oftentimes children are uh, not considered as children when they are over 12, 14 and so on. And this has got devastating effects. Now also if you look at the literature, there are very many uh, terminologies or terms used for children in migration situations like minors, children, young persons and those in migrant situations, migrants, unaccompanied, refugee, asylum seeking, displaced or children on the move. And obviously this should be much uh, more uh, clear for those who are using these terminologies because the consequences on the use of terminology are also vast, as we all know. When uh, we are talking about the data on children, and, and surprisingly, when it comes to um, uh, children in situation of migrations, there are a whole lot of data compared to the data available and reliable when it comes to children in general. And it has got most probably very strong political uh, reasons. Uh, however, when we are talking about the definitions of those children who are uh, in uh, migration situations, we have to look at those who are traveling alone, they are an unaccompanied kids, those who are uh, together with their families or guardians, and there are also um, children who are accompanied by adults, but they are not their relatives or members of their kin. Uh, oftentimes, sadly enough, those who are forced into child marriage and they are accompanied by the adults um, um, who are, in formally at least, their uh, partners. Now, a couple of uh, shocking facts. I guess we have to be confronted with, uh, with it because oftentimes we are not aware of the extent 
of uh, the situation of children in migration. One in 80 children were living in forced displacement, which is a huge number if you are looking at the quality of life of children and the risks and the threat and the um, dangers they are, um, 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 uh, they are facing. It means, 12, as of 16, 2016 only, 12 million children refugees and as asylum seekers, 16 million children who've been living in internal di displacement due to conflict, violence and exploitation, and another 7 million who have been internally displaced by natural, natural disasters. And there is a very special category of children we hardly ever talk about, because in this case, the migration situation concerns the parents and not the ki kids directly. And these are the children whose parents have to leave, primarily for employment reasons. And in China alone, there are over 60 million children who are left behind by the parents because, the, because of the lack of employment, parents cannot work locally. So they have to move to cities, to, to uh, places where they can find employment. But because of the circumstances, and China is in a very special situation because there is a, a strict regulation that wherever you were born, you are only there entitled to health and education services, meaning that if the parents are taking the kids with them, because they would love to take good care of them and nurture them, then these kids have no access to health and education. If they left them behind, then they can send money home, they can find a better life for themselves and for the children, but obviously then the children are lacking uh, the parental guidance. There is a lot of evidence actually, and this is not only China of course, we know that Southeast Asia and other parts, even Europe, if you look at many European countries, Moldova, Ukraine, and many former um, um, Soviet republics, but also, for instance, in Cambodia, there are two million people working in Thailand, leaving their children behind. This means that, practically speaking, these are not the children who are in the migration situation, but they are very severely affected by the fact that, that the parents are leaving. Also, millions of children had moved with, within or across the borders, looking for better opportunities, accessing food, education, health care, and even family reunion. Uh, between 2005 and 15, according to the UNHCR's man mandate, um, um, because we ob obviously don't know about all the kids, uh, the number of child refugees uh, more than doubled. This is a very scary number because this means that we are not handling this situation properly. So that we do not know there are no proper tools and policies in place uh, to uh, stop uh, the uh, displacement and migration of, of children, meaning that from two, 4 million to 9 million in 10 years, which is quite scary if you look, we look at it as a tendency. If you look at the numbers or the proportion of children, um, they make up one third of the world's population. However, almost half of the refugees and children in migration situation are children, meaning over 50 million children. Uh, what is also interesting and should be uh, taken care of, that nine out of 10 refugee children remain in the same region, meaning that we should be much more are conscious about the need for local services, for local solutions, because co uh, compared to the notion, most of the children are not moving very far from their birth of origin, rather they are seeking some support nearby, and the question is whether any policies or practices are uh, focusing on this opportunity. And also, what is also scary, that despite of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and all the human rights provisions, over 100 countries currently are detaining children as a form of punishment uh, of those who are in migration situations, meaning that children are looked at as offenders and not as victims of the migration situations. At least 300,000 uh, unaccompanied and separated children were registered in the different countries uh, in 2015-16 uh, alone, who were crossing the borders without any adult 
uh, companion. Um, this also means that these children are, when it comes to identity, when it comes to uh, the opportunities to, um, to be protected, are the most vulnerable kids because obviously they are not accompanied either by parents or any, any other responsible adult who could be of help when they are uh, at risk of exploitation, abuse, and other forms of violence. Now, another sad news is that although the world seems to be quite peaceful uh, for some, currently almost one of uh, 10 children around the world are living in countries and areas uh, that are affected by armed conflicts, and over 4 million, uh, 400 million live in extreme poverty. Now, this is again, as we know, one of the root causes why many children and families try to leave the, 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 uh, the place of origin. And obviously, this is something we also should tackle if we could, and we should actually. Also, trafficking has been a substantial reason why children are on the move. Uh, in 2016 alone, 28% uh, of all the traffic, uh, that detected trafficking uh, victims were children, meaning that this has become, according to many, a, b a better business, if you like, or a bigger business than the uh, drug business, trafficking children. And 20% uh, uh, were girls and 8 uh, percent boys, um, and we know that this uh, the the effects of the uh, trafficking um, is uh, devastating from the future perspective of the children. What I also like to uh, would like to draw your attention to is the um, chances or or opportunities of these children, because obviously they will be also those adults who are making decisions about our future. And they are also becoming, as we could see from the, it was quite shocking, the picture of the teenagers creating, in a very creative way, uh, the cyber attacks. Meaning that, depending on what we are doing, the way we are handling children, they might make good programs or actually devastating and deadly programs. So that is also important. Refugee children are five times more likely to be out of school uh, than other kids, and only 50% of the refugee children are enrolled in primary and less than 25% in secondary school. Obviously not meaning that they are not able to produce wonderful programs on a computer, because many children are, so, uh, are so, uh, quite self-contained. And actually also, on the other hand, when we it, it comes to, the, um, to um, computers, what we have seen in the, in the Committee on the Rights of the Child, we had a, a, a huge general day of discussion in the UN in Geneva in 2014. Um, it is clear that there are much more advantages than disadvantages because obviously uh, um, computers and social media and the openness uh, is providing an opportunity for many children who otherwise would be isolated and excluded from education and other opportunities to learn and to uh, get information and share information. However, we have to be careful what is the proportion of protection and um, uh, enabling access and, um, for, for all those. Now, just narrowing a little bit uh, this topic to Europe, one third of the refugees and migrants who have arrived in Europe are children. Uh, they come primarily from three countries, Syria, most, uh, more than half of them, Iraq and Afghanistan. And obviously, uh, most of the kids are coming from Syria and they end up, many of them, in Turkey, in the refugee camps, uh, as they have the largest refugee population in the world, where almost half of the refugees are children, uh, kept in... Um, refugee camps. Interestingly, uh, during the last couple of years, uh, working on the institutionalization of children, we have also put the refugee camp into our vocabulary as a form of institutionalization, because obviously the same kind of harm is caused by isolating, locking up kids, not providing proper access to healthcare, education, uh, and any future for these kids. So it is obviously um, extremely important to be considered the devastating effect and long-term effect 
of uh, the refugee situation, but also the refugee camps themselves on children. There are children, as we know, all over the world who are now uh, who have been brought up in, in, in camps and have never had the chance to visit their homeland. In um, people in uh, growing up in, for instance, I remember these um, kids growing up in uh, Nepal who who couldn't go back to Bhutan, for instance, or other countries in the neighbors or um, in in the, um, in Congo during the Rwanda crisis, who have never had the chance to 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 um, visit their homeland and uh, losing all their relatives over there. So, what are the children of what are the needs of the children in these situations of migration? UNICEF has been um, working on a roadmap, providing guidelines to um, improve the care and protection of the children in uh, migration situations, and especially those who are unaccompanied. And this is very clear. I mean, it's common sense, but we have to repeat it again and again because it doesn't seem to happen that the children should be provided with safety, protection, proper health care, adequate nutrition. Many of them have been starving and uh, uh, are, are, are malnourished. Education, access to play, caring relationship and psychosocial support to work on the trauma, suffering and their impact. And here I guess it is extremely important to recognize and acknowledge that the interlinkage between the conflict, between the insecurity you've been talking about and the upbringing of children is much closer than one would imagine. Because obviously if these children are traumatized and they are suffering and they are angry, then obviously they will be the next generation who are making decisions on our life and if not for other reasons, not for the good reasons to provide them a joyful and happy childhood, we should be selfish enough to take good care of the children, not to ruin the world. So what can we do? We should support the long-term integration of the children in situations of migration into the communities where they are now, uh, but also ensuring the right to their identity, language, culture and traditions and return to their place of origin if this is in the best interests of the given child. Now this is a huge topic, obviously in 10 minutes I can't talk about it. I guess we are not talking about, uh, enough about the role of each and e every uh, single characteristic that is contributing to the well-being of children and their future. Uh, uh, character and attitude and motivation and if we are not taking into consideration all the uh, positive and risk uh, uh, elements of these then we can end up in an unresolvable situation very soon actually. So uh, what are the uh, uh, SDG uh, era progress targets for 2013? It's quite a ambitious but not very realistic one. But I have to list it because, again, this is something the UN has endorsed. There is a clear kind of vision on how to uh, um, achieve that without any realistic policy and funding behind it. Every child survives and thrives by 2030. Every child learns, whatever. Every child is protected from violence and exploitation. Every child lives in a safe and clean environment and every child has a fair chance in life. I guess that's totally irrational. I mean, considering the current opportunities and situations, but it, it would be really worse, uh, I mean, challenging these kind of targets and, and really thinking over how could we be strategic and achieve at least some of it and what are the minimum requirements to contribute to these kind of very ambitious and very positive targets. So, fini finishing my very short and I hope uh, shocking enough um, contribution, I would like to quote the statement of the children at the UN summit in 2000, because I like this quote very much, that uh, what the children were saying that we want a word fit for children because a word fit for us is a word that fits for everyone. And I guess we should think it over. That if the word is 
pseudo, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good place to live for children, then probably it's also a friendly and nice place for all of us. And the other one, which is equally important, that you call us the future, but we are also the present. I guess we have to emphasize that children are not only investment into the future, and it's not all about us. It's all about their current situation and their well-being and joyful childhood, because uh, it is also serving our well-being, but also then children feel that they are human beings who are valued, and they are not just an investment as human capital. Thank you for your attention.